to Levco, Manufacturing Division of Graphic Laminating Incorporated. I'm Tony Mann, your host. I'm standing in front of our plant here in Hemlock, New York. Beautiful Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. I will be your host. So let's go inside and start in on your instructional video. This video was designed for you with two purposes in mind. One to give you a step-by-step -step guide to the functions and operations of your new LEDCO digital finishing station, and two, to help you understand the tasks of laminating and mounting big color images. This video is to be used in conjunction with your owner's operator's manual to ensure years of problem-free operation. Section 1, Setup. If you have not already done so, remove the laminator from its shipping crate, assemble the stand, which comes standard with the 60 inch and optional with the 42, per the instructions. Note, hardware and wrench are included, but you will need an adjustable wrench to complete the assembly. Place the machine on its stand and secure it with the hardware. If you have purchased the optional casters, please install them prior to putting the laminator on the stand. The machine can now be plugged in or hardwired per its correct electrical requirements and is ready for use. See line 4 of your delivery checklist. If options such as the roll feed or release line or take up have been ordered, unpack them now and make ready for the installation, which is mostly having an adequate power outlet nearby for the release line or take up. Inside the crate you will find a smaller accessory box that includes the owner's operator's manual along with a plastic bag that contains extra fuses, a zippy cutter, and four aluminum stop collars with plastic thumb screws. Please take time to read the operator's manual from cover to cover, highlighting or underlining anything you don't understand. If you need clarification on anything or still have questions remaining after reading the manual, viewing this video, or practicing on your new digital laminator, please call your dealer or contact us directly at 800-937-9293. It is important to do this before a small problem becomes a large problem. We strongly urge you to pay particular attention to all safety precautions printed in the manual and on the placard attached to the feed tray. This machine is essentially a power tool and very serious injury can result if safety features are ignored, removed, or compromised in any other way. We suggest you spend 8 to 10 practice hours over the course of the next few days to thoroughly familiarize yourself with the components, functionality, safety features, techniques, and application nuances before tackling a production run. Never hesitate to call your dealer or LEDCO for answers to your questions. Section 2. Getting to know your digital laminator. We will now move over to the laminator and familiarize ourselves with its components and controls. First, the heat shoes. The two smooth, black Teflon-coated heating surfaces located here directly in front of the two front laminating rubber rollers are called heat shoes. These provide the heat needed to activate the adhesives in the laminating films. This heat, coupled with the pressure at the nip, or contact point between the top and bottom laminating rollers, are what essentially create a good lamination. The heat shoes are thermostatically controlled to be set at specific optimal performance temperatures by using these two controls located on the right-hand side housing control panel. We will discuss these and other controls later. Next, by swinging the top heat shoe up and out of the way, we get a good view of the top and bottom laminating rollers and the nip, or contact point. The nip can be opened and closed by the roll pressure knobs located here on the outside of the right housing cover. The front roll pressure knob opens and closes the front laminating rubber rollers and the rear pressure knob opens and closes the rear pull rollers. Speaking of the rear pull rollers, located here at the rear of the machine, they are identical to and interchangeable with the front laminating rollers. This feature provides you with insurance against downtime while waiting for replacement rollers to arrive. You can exchange the laminating and pull rollers and continue with your lamination in the event of accidental damage or the normal wearing out of your laminating rollers. The rear 
Pull rollers are also slightly overdriven mechanically to gently pull the lamination web taut as it passes from the front lamination rollers and out the back of the machine. This helps ensure a flat, wave-free, wrinkle-free lamination. The rubber rollers are driven by a heavy-duty, quarter-horsepower drive motor mounted inside the machine with controls for on-off, forward, reverse jog, and variable speed located on the control panel. We'll touch on these later. Next, we have the top and bottom supply roll mandrels. The supply roll mandrels hold the rolls of laminating film. On the ends of the supply roll mandrels are knurled steel tension knobs and black steel tension springs. These knobs and springs adjust the amount of tension, or drag, on the unwinding stream of laminating film, technically called the web. As it passes around the idlers, over the heat shoes, through the nip, and out the back of the laminator. Running the width of the supply rolls are the anodized aluminum gripper rods. There are three of them per supply roll mandrel. These rods, once activated by a half-turn rotation of the cardboard core of the roll of laminating film, will securely grip the inside of the core of film regardless of the direction of the unwind. As a note of interest, and to avoid potential tension-related problems, let's look at the hex adapters of the supply roll mandrels located to the inside of the tension knobs and springs. These allow you to slide the supply roll mandrel into place via their mounting notches located on the side panels. On just one of the hex adapters per supply roll, you will find a milled slot with a split drive pin located inside this milled slot. This pin should never be all the way to the right or left of the inside of this slot, or you will have no remaining range of tension adjustment from one side to the other. The best technique for initial supply roll tension adjustment is to loosen the tension knobs on both sides so they are just touching the tension springs, making note to keep the hex adapter drive pin fairly centered in its slot. Then put three to four half turns of tension on one side and then the same amount of half turns on the other side. Next, let's unpack the feed tray. Put the molded plastic thumb screws in place on the feed guide blocks and slide the guide pins on either side of the feed tray into the center slot of the white Delrin feed tray mounting brackets, gently pushing the feed tray forward until it drops slightly and seats itself. This procedure will become second nature with some practice. Please note, the machine will not operate unless the feed tray, as well as the safety shield, are in their proper position. The feed tray comes with two positionable guides that can be secured into place for precision feeding. Now, with the feed tray in place and making sure we have removed all packing straps, rubber bands, tape, and plastic ties from the machine, we can plug the machine into its proper outlet. See line 4 of your delivery checklist. Go to the back of the machine and switch on upward, the master power switch. Check all four emergency stop buttons. They should be in the up positions. If any one of the stop buttons is in the down position, depress and turn it clockwise slightly until it pops up. The machine will not operate with any of the emergency stop buttons depressed. Now let's move to the control panel. First, there are top and bottom heat controls. To engage the heat controls, press the larger red button. It will light up and the display will come on showing the actual present temperature. To raise the temperature, press the red adjustment button once to display the set point value screen. Press the red adjustment button again to raise the set point value. Hold the red adjustment button to raise the set point value rapidly. Wait 5 seconds for the actual present temperature to be displayed. To lower the temperature, Press the red adjustment button once to display the set point value screen. Press the blue adjustment button to lower the set point value. Hold the blue adjustment button to decrease the set point value rapidly. Wait 5 seconds for the actual present temperature to be displayed. To switch from Fahrenheit to Celsius, hold the blue button for 5 seconds. Use the red or blue button to toggle from F to C. Wait 5 seconds for the actual present temperature to be displayed. When setting the heat on the laminator, always consult the owner operator's manual. We also advise you to consult your film supplier to learn the optimal temperature ranges for the laminating films you are going to use. We will talk more about film later, but generally, when using a good 5mm copolymer film, 
250 degrees Fahrenheit is a good place to start. Now let's move on to the motor drive controls which are to the immediate right center of the heat controls. First, there is a green forward drive button that turns the system on and off. Next to it is the black forward reverse selector switch and to the right of that is the red reverse drive momentary switch. Reverse will work only when the green drive button is on, the forward reverse selector switch is set on reverse and you manually depress the red reverse drive momentary switch. The reverse drive switch can be invaluable to help avoid problems or clear misfeeds. Above these switches is the speed control knob. This controls the rate of laminating drive speed. Variable speed controls are crucial to enable you to run a wide variety of film and mounting material thicknesses. Note, the dial of the speed control knob reads from 0 to 100 in increments of 10. This does not represent feet per minute. It is the percent of the top speed of 30 feet per minute. For example, a reading of 10 would represent 3 feet per minute or 10% of the maximum 30 feet per minute. A setting of 20 would represent 20% of 30 feet per minute or 6 feet per minute, and so on. Most laminating jobs are done between the 20 and 30% settings, with mounting operations done at fairly slower speeds. Located below the reverse jog switch is the blue fan switch. Depressing this switch will engage the cooling fan, or fans on the 60 inch. The cooling fan helps to cool the film and laminated piece to below melt temperature while they are pulled tight and perfectly flat between the laminating rollers and the pull rollers. This cooling helps to alleviate heat wrinkles, warping, and waving. The major reason for fans on a laminator is to cool the film, not the machine. Now, let's look at the rubber roll pressure control knobs. As the laminating and pull rollers are shipped in the open position, turn the roll pressure knobs counterclockwise to engage the rollers. Open and close the rollers several times to get acquainted with them. Notice that if you turn the knobs clockwise as far as they can go, the rollers are open. Turning the knobs counterclockwise a half turn, you can feel and hear the rolls close. Another quarter turn counterclockwise closes and locks them. Almost all of your straight laminating encapsulating jobs will be done with the rolls in the closed and locked position. Foam boards and other easily compressible mounting boards up to and including 3 16 thicknesses can also be run with the rollers in the closed and locked positions with no fear of bowing the rolls. However, foam boards over 3 16 of an inch thick or rigid boards such as gator board or centra over 1 8 inch thick should be run with the rolls closed but not locked to allow the rollers to float over the harder or thicker substrates. Finally, always leave the rollers open when you are not using the machine to avoid developing flat spots on your rubber rollers. Now that we have become familiar with the components and controls, let's get some film, thread up the machine, and have some fun. Section 3. Threading the Laminator. Although this machine can be threaded cold, some operators feel it is easier to thread while it is warming up or already hot. I personally prefer threading it while it's cold so as not to burn my fingers. If you haven't already done so, remove the feed tray and carefully set it aside. Now is a good time to review the threading diagram in your owner operator's manual. The main point to remember is that the shiny, smoother side of the film, the polyester, must go against the heat shoe and the dull polyethylene, adhesive side, must never go against the heat shoe and should face out toward the operator. Now. As anyone who has ever made the mistake of putting the dull adhesive side of the film against a fully heated heat shoe can tell you, it results in a truly heinous mess. The adhesive sticks to the heat shoes and anything else it comes into contact with, rollers, motor cover, etc., and is a major problem, pain, to clean off and make right again. So in review, always remember that the shiny side of the film goes against the heat shoe, and the dull side faces out toward you, away from the heat shoe. After identifying the shiny and dull sides of your film roll, you can determine which way to slide it onto your supply roll mandrels. Note, there are four 3-inch diameter stop collars included with the machine. They are designed to help you conveniently align your top and bottom rolls of film, and can be used to hold your film rolls in place if necessary. I generally just use one per mandrel, for easy alignment. Just slip one on any end, take a measurement from the side panel and lock it into place. Do the same thing for the bottom roll.
Note. Hoisting the film rolls onto the supply roll mandrels is best done by two people, especially with the larger diameter rolls of film. <gasps> Safety note. Attempting to load the film onto the laminator by yourself may result in back strain or other injury. To load the film, lift one end of the top supply roll mandrel up and away from the side panel. Have your partner lift the roll of film up to that end and gently slide the roll of film onto the top supply roll mandrel until it rests against the stop collar. Then lower the supply roll mandrel back into its notch in the side panel making sure it's fully seated. With the top roll of film in place on the mandrel, and the shiny side of the film facing down, pass the film under the lower idler, over the top idler, and drape it over the top heat shoe. Note, do not drape it over the safety shield. You are now ready to load the bottom supply roll mandrel. Again, making sure the shiny side of the film will go against the heat shoe and the dull side away from the heat shoe, load the bottom roll of film onto the bottom mandrel in the same manner as the top. Check your stop collars to be sure your top and bottom rolls are aligned then pass the web of film under the idler near the bottom heat shoe. Use extreme care if the heat shoe is already heated up as they can burn you. Pull the bottom web up and drape it over the top web. When the machine is hot, the two webs will stick together. If threading while cold, use tape to hold the bottom web in place. With both rolls threaded and the supply rolls fully seated in their respective brackets, unwind the top and bottom supply rolls about a half turn each. This will provide enough slack in the web to allow the feed tray to slide on easily. Find your feed tray and slide it back into position. Position the safety shield forward toward the heat shoe. Remember the drive will not engage without the feed tray and safety shield in their proper positions. Make sure there is still some slack in the film webs. Close and lock the rolls via the pressure knobs. With the film draped over the two heat shoes and melted or taped together, push one end of the threading card located on the feed tray when unpacking, into the nip until you feel it firmly positioned against the laminating rollers. If a threading card is not available, a good sized piece of cardstock or poster board will work. Push the green forward drive button to engage the drive and set your speed dial knob at around 10%. If the film and the threading card are adequately in the nip, the point where the laminating rollers meet, the film and threading card will start into the laminator. If it fails to grip them, unwind a little more slack in the webs and gently push the threading card forward into the nip until the rolls grip it and draw it through. As the film and threading cards pass through the laminating rollers, look over the side panel and between the front and rear laminating rollers to make sure the film and card are clearly passing from the front rollers to the rear rollers and out the back of the machine. Once the threading card has cleared the back of the machine, disengage the green drive button to stop. Section 4. Laminating. Now that the machine is threaded correctly, let's set and check our temperatures for the films we are using. If you have threaded the machine cold, turn on the heat controls now and set them for the desired temperatures. From a cold start, the machine will be ready in 12 to 15 minutes. While the machine is heating up, open both sets of rollers, set the speed control to around 10% and engage the forward drive. This allows the laminating rollers to turn and get evenly heated while the machine is warming up. Evenly heated rollers contribute to the quality of the lamination by eliminating the chance of imperfections in the finished lamination caused by cold spots on the laminating rollers. Position the feed guides to help you feed your images squarely into the nip. You will get the best results by centering items in the web. Check and balance the supply roll tension on both mandrels. Start by loosening both knobs until there is no pressure on the springs. Tighten each knob until it begins to press on its springs. For initial adjustment, put three to four half turns of adjustment on each knob. Once the machine has come to temperature, you are ready to make final adjustments of the supply roll tension. With the heat on, rollers closed, push the green forward drive button and watch the film as it passes over the heat shoes. You will probably see some waviness or wrinkling in the leading edge of both shoes. The leading edge would be the top of the top heat shoe and the bottom of the bottom heat shoe, the edges that the webs of film first come into contact with. If the waviness or wrinkling, sometimes called fingering, extends from the leading edge into the laminating rollers, the supply roll tension needs to be increased. Remember, when adjusting supply roll tension to adjust both ends of the supply roll mandrel evenly to keep the tension relatively the same for both the bottom and top supply rolls.
If the laminate coming out of the back of the machine is curling upward, there may be too much tension on the top mandrel or not enough on the bottom. Adjust your tension knobs accordingly to get the lamination to run as flat as possible. A little bit of waviness or wrinkling on the leading edge is acceptable as long as it does not extend into the nip and onto the laminated web. Examine the film going out of the back of the machine and adjust the tension to eliminate remaining wrinkles or bubbles. Also, when running any thickness of film over 1.5 mil, be sure to run the cooling fans to help alleviate heat rippling and wrinkling. As mentioned before, for best results, the film should be tight and flat between the laminating and pull rollers. If it gets out of the back of the machine while it is still at or above melt temperature, heat wrinkles and distortion can occur. Once you have run off enough film to alleviate wrinkling and get the lamination running relatively flat, you are ready to run a couple of samples of your work through the laminator. This will also help you get comfortable feeding items into the nip. Take your image and lie it flat on the feed tray, positioned against or very close to your feed guides and square to the nip. Make sure it has been made as flat as possible to avoid wrinkling or fold over when you push it into the nip. Note. The laminator has an anti-curl strip right before the nip on the feed tray to help you flatten out slight curls and imperfections. Now, with the temperature at its predetermined setting, the rollers down and locked, and the fans on, press the green drive button to on and set the speed dial at between 10 and 15 percent. Allow approximately 4 to 5 inches of laminate to pass through the nip to clear any wrinkles, then gently push your image into the nip until you feel the rolls grasp the piece and start pulling it through the laminator. At the moment you feel the machine take hold of the piece, stop pushing forward and use a slight backwards fanning and flattening motion to help ensure the piece lies flat and wrinkle free as it is pulled through the laminator. Once the piece clears the nip, it will proceed over the cooling fans, through the pull rollers and out the back of the machine in a beautifully laminated, fully encapsulated state. Once the image has cleared the pull rollers by two to three inches, you can now shut the drive off and trim your piece. As mentioned before, running some practice prints is recommended not only to get a feel for the technique, but also to be sure the images have a good laminating bond. While most offset printed materials laminate very easily with a tremendous bond, some inks and papers used in inkjet printing may not adhere quite as well. To determine how well your laminated piece has adhered, we will perform what is known as the X test. Using a utility knife, score the top of the laminated piece in an X pattern. Lift the edge and pull back. If you lift ink and paper fibers as you pull back, you have a good bond. If you pull back the laminate with no resistance or without lifting ink or fibers, the lamination is not good. More heat and or a slower laminating speed may be required to get an acceptable bond. If you still cannot get an acceptable bond after adjusting the speed and heat several times, give us a call. We will evaluate your combination of film, speed settings, heat settings, inks, paper, etc. and make recommendations. With some practice, this video and your owner operator's manual as guides, you are now ready to begin production work. Section 5 Laminating film. Most thermal laminating film consists of two layers, a base layer of polyester and an adhesive layer of polyethylene. The polyester layer, the shiny side of the film, is the harder outer surface of the film and does not melt at laminating temperatures. It provides rigidity and protection for your laminated items. The greater the polyester content, the higher the level of protection, rigidity, and luster. The polyethylene layer, the dull side of the film, melts at laminating temperatures and bonds the film onto the subject material under the pressure of the laminating rollers. As the X test described earlier demonstrates, this adhesive is melted, then pressed into the paper and inks, making one integrated piece consisting of paper, ink, and laminating film. The proportion of polyester to polyethylene in the film is usually described as a ratio. For example, a number 1-2 film would be a 3 mil film with 1 mil of polyester and 2 mils of polyethylene. The first number refers to the base layer, the second to the adhesive layer. A mil is equal to 1 1,000th one of an inch. Since polyester is the more costly of the polymers, or plastics, used in these copolymer films, a number 3-2 film will generally cost a little more than a 2-3 film, although both are called 5 mil. Also, 
the number 3-2 film will seem a little thicker than the number 2-3 because it is slightly stiffer. Laminating films are available in many different base-to-adhesive combinations. In the United States laminating trade, the generally accepted practice is to describe two-sided lamination, or encapsulation, by the thickness of one layer of film. For example, 3 mil lamination should refer to lamination with two layers of 3 mil film. If you are buying or selling laminating film or laminating services, please make sure everyone who needs to know understands the film descriptions being used. We encourage you to experiment with different films. There are many finishes available such as glossy, the most popular, satin, matte, textured, marbleized, black films, films with protective liners, films with adhesive for window graphics or mounting, and more. The cost of thermal films compared to the pressure sensitive films is so low that you can afford the luxury of experimenting without breaking the bank. We suggest you try various combinations of film. For example, use a glossy film on the top mandrel with a matte or satin on the bottom mandrel. This allows you to offer different finishes without changing the setup. You can run an image upside down to get a matte or satin finish on the front of your piece without having to change rolls of film. Section 6. Simultaneous Laminating and Mounting one of the features that truly set our Leadco laminators apart from the competitors' units is the ability to simultaneously laminate and mount items in one pass with no major setup change. This means that your machine is not just a laminator, but is truly a finishing station. We are going to demonstrate the two most preferred and easiest techniques being used to simultaneously mount and laminate. The first, Tony's personal favorite, is using pre-coated, heat-sensitive adhesive foam boards. The second, more labor-intensive and slightly more difficult method uses a PSA, pressure-sensitive adhesive, board with a peel-away liner. Both style boards should be available through your film and or media supplier. Give us a call at 800-937-9293 if you need the names of sources for these boards. In preparation for simultaneously mounting and laminating, you should raise the temperature of the heat shoes about 20 to 30 degrees above the normal laminating temperature for the film you are using. This will help drive the extra heat needed for a good bond between the image and the coated board, as the foam boards tend to draw heat out of the heat shoes. The rubber rollers can remain in the down and locked position provided you are mounting to foam boards no thicker than 3 16 of an inch thick. For anything over 3 16 of an inch thick, you can bring the rollers down, but do not lock them. With heat-activated coated boards, there is generally a tissue type of protective liner on the face. Remove that and position your image to be mounted on the board. As you can feel, this board has a slightly tacky feel to it. It is designed to hold your image in place while allowing you to reposition the image. You simply lift up the image and reposition it to where you want it before mounting and laminating. Once you have the image where you want it to be, and with the temperature at its higher setting, you simply run it through the laminator as you would a regular laminating job. We recommend you run it slightly slower to allow more time for the increased heat to work into the board and adhesive. It's really that easy. Pretty nice, huh? The PSA, or pressure sensitive adhesive coated boards, require a little more finesse. Because this adhesive is very aggressive, proper initial positioning of the image is crucial. Cut a piece of the PSA board slightly larger than your image. Peel back about 4 inches of the release liner on the leading edge. Use that exposed adhesive to position and align your image on the board and smooth it down into place. With the machine still threaded and up to temperature, put the leading edge of the board with the image stuck to it under the smoothing strip at the front of the feed tray. Keep the board here for a moment while you turn on the drive and advance the film enough to clear the film that had been resting on the heat shoes. Now push the board squarely into the nip. Once you feel it grip the board and image, hold on to the release liner, pulling it back as the board and image advance into the nip. It is advisable to hold the image up slightly, allowing the smoother bar to do its job and smooth the print as it is being drawn into the nip and pressed to the board. As the board and image pass through the nip, be sure to completely pull away the release liner. As you can see, the end result is the same as using the heat activated boards, but a little more technique is involved with the PSA boards. PSA boards are generally a little less expensive, so your trade-off is labor, time, skill, versus the cost of the board. People often ask why you have to laminate both sides when mounting. Why can't you just laminate the front side? There are actually four very good reasons. One, you save setup time by laminating both sides, because your laminator is usually already set up with two rolls of film. 
one on the top and one on the bottom. Two, one-sided lamination is more labor-intensive. For details about this, consult your owner-operator's manual. Three, laminating both sides adds an extra layer of protection and rigidity. And four, and most important, foam board is porous and will absorb moisture. If you have not protected the back as well as the front from moisture, the board will eventually begin to curl. Once your image is mounted and laminated to the board, final finishing options are many, including putting on edge grippers for hanging, framing, where you also have many options, edging with a plastic U-channel, putting an easel on the back for countertop displaying, and so forth. Let your imagination be your guide. Now that we have covered the basic setup, operation, threading, laminating, and mounting, let's move on to using the release liner take-up option. The release liner take-up option provides you the use of cold laminating or PSA films that require the removal of a release liner during application. Section 7. Cold laminating mounting with the release liner take-up option. Although designed primarily for thermal lamination of wide format inkjet and digital prints, the digital 42 and 60 inch machines are capable of applying cold or PSA or pressure sensitive adhesive films with the addition of the release liner take up option. Place the release liner take up on the top of the machine so that the motor is on the right side of the top housing as Tony is demonstrating. Place an empty laminating roll onto the scrap rewind bar and secure it into place with the core grippers, again as Tony is demonstrating. Load the PSA film onto the top supply roll mandrel. Be careful lifting the heavy rolls. You know what could happen. Try to center the core of the film. Feed the film, adhesive and liner side up, over the first idler bar. Separate the release liner from the film at a corner using two pieces of tape. You can see that this is an acquired skill. Fold over the leading edges of the adhesive side of the film to give you a non-sticky, more manageable piece to work with. Slide this folded over section down behind the safety shield and wedge it into the nip using a threading leader board, preferably as wide as the film. Attach the release liner to the empty core with many pieces of tape after you determine the direction of the rotation. Roll the liner onto the core until it is taut. Turn on the forward drive and set the speed control to just barely creep along while turning on the release liner take up. As the threading leader board with film attached passes through the nip rollers, get some scrap pieces to run through so the adhesive does not come into contact with the rollers and cause a wraparound. As the film unwinds, the liner separates at the second idler and is automatically wound around the scrap rewind and core. The take-up tension is adjustable, as is the supply roll tension to alleviate any wrinkling of the web. When doing cold lamination using PSA films, try not to let exposed adhesive go into the machine. Your material to be coated should be at least as wide as the film. Overlap pieces or use scrap paper in between pieces to keep adhesive off the rollers and prevent wraparounds. Not only can you do clear overlaminating with PSA films using the release liner take-up mechanism, you can also pre-coat your own foam boards. Using the same setup and operating procedures, run foam board through the laminator to apply two-sided adhesive paper. Once you have coated the boards, they can be used to mount and laminate any graphic as shown earlier in this video. Other options are available, such as the roll feed, which allows you to take very long banners and signage and roll them onto a core and unwind them into the laminator under tension, and the retractable inline slitters are available and are featured in detail in our owner-operator's manual. If you have any questions regarding the setup or operation of these specific options, please call your dealer or contact Ledco at 800-937-9293. Section 8. Cleaning, Maintenance, and Basic Troubleshooting. Before we get started with this segment of our video, please remember always use extreme caution when performing maintenance on your machine. Always make sure the machine is unplugged and that there is no power to the laminator when cleaning or working on any part of it. Bypassing, modifying, or in any other way altering the safety features will not only void the warranty, but could result in very serious injuries or even death. We may portray this in a humorous light. However, 
Dealing with 220 volts of power and a quarter horsepower worth of nip torque is no joke. Always use extreme caution to avoid pinch points at the nip of the rollers. Never have rubber rollers turning while performing maintenance to your machine. Never wear loose clothing, ties, or jewelry while operating or performing maintenance to your machine. To clean the shoes, first clear the machine of any film threaded in it. Then heat the shoes to full laminating temperature to soften excess or built up adhesive that might be on them. Put on some heavy gloves or oven mitts to protect your hands. Using a soft, clean, dry cloth, gently rub the adhesive or dirt buildup off the shoes. Never use any abrasive material or rub too hard on the shoes because you could remove the Teflon coating. Use a gentle, non-solvent type of cleaner like 409 or Simple Green to complete the cleaning process. Be careful not to get burned from any steaming action when cleaning the hot heat shoes. To clean the rubber rollers, swing away the top heat shoe, being careful not to get burned if it is still hot. This allows you to have better access to the front laminating rollers. Clean the rubber rollers with a mildly abrasive cleaning pad such as a white Scotch-Brite pad that you can pick up in the household section of your local grocery store. Again, you can use a non-solvent cleaner or mildly soapy water to assist in lifting away the dislodged adhesive and buildup. Simply wipe the rollers clean, rubbing firmly, but not scrubbing so hard as to mar the rollers. Never use sharp objects or steel wool as they will gouge or mar the rollers. Another way to clean the rolls is to use a rubber cement pickup eraser that can be found at any art or office supply store. You simply rub the eraser firmly over any debris. Please note, since the power has been disconnected and the feed tray and safety shield are off, the rollers will be hard to turn by hand, but you need to turn them in order to clean the complete circumference of the rollers. Lubrication is another maintenance issue to consider. Leadco uses all sealed ball bearings, so no lubing is required on the bearings. However, the drive chain and sprockets on all models should receive a light coat of gear lube or heavy grease. Here at the plant, we use a white lithium grease. This should be done after each 1,000 hours of operation, or about twice a year. Basic troubleshooting is next. Generally, any problems with the machine fall into three categories. The drive system, the heat system, and web tension, wrinkling, and adhesion. A. Drive system, or having no drive. Here there are some basic things to check. Make sure the unit is plugged into a proper power source. Consult your owner operator's manual. Make sure the main power breaker on the back of the laminator is switched up to the on position. Also be sure all emergency stops, the big red buttons, are disengaged. Also, make sure the feed tray, safety shield, and housing doors are in their proper positions. If all of these components are in place and there is still no drive, Disconnect the power cord. Using a Phillips head screwdriver to disengage the two half-turned screws on the right side housing, open the door and visually check the two rows of fuses located where Tony is pointing on the base of the housing. These 0.5 amp and 1.5 amp fuses are the first line of defense for the components in the machine. Even if these fuses look okay visually, you may want to check them with a continuity tester to be completely sure of their integrity. If they check out OK, go on to the two 12 amp fuses located directly to the left of the motor speed control board. If any of these fuses are blown, use only the same amperage fuses to replace them with from the spare fuse packet provided in your spare parts box that came with your laminator. If after replacing a fuse or two, or if there were no problem fuses, you still do not have drive, please contact your dealer or LEDCO, 800-937. 9293 for advice. At this point, you will probably need to have a qualified service person or electrician involved. B. The heat system. If you are having heat problems, i.e. no heat or uncontrollable heat, stop a minute to clearly define the problem. Determine if it is a top or bottom heat shoe problem. Follow the initial checklist of power supply, safety switches, feed tray, fuses, etc. 
Be sure to check the 20 amp fuses with a continuity tester to see if they are functional. If blown, replace them with new ones of the same amperage. If, after replacing the fuses, there is still no heat, you can check the heater with a continuity tester to see if they are good at the contact points. If there is no continuity at the contact points, the heaters are most likely bad and will need to be replaced by a qualified servicing technician. If these initial procedures can't remedy the problem, please call your dealer for more in-depth multimeter testing of the relays and or heat control board. If uncontrollable heat is happening, it is caused either by a shorted thermocouple, heat sensor wire, or a relay is stuck. One way to troubleshoot the relay is to exchange it wire for wire with its opposite one, top for bottom, etc. And if the problem follows, it is definitely the relay. If the problem does not follow in the exchange just mentioned, it could be the thermocouple. Give your dealer or LEDCO a call and we will explain some more detailed procedures. C. Even with a properly functioning machine, sometimes problems with wrinkling, waviness, and non-adhesion can occur. Please refer to your owner operator's manual for suggested tension settings and temperature settings. Also, consult with your film and media suppliers for their suggestions regarding temperature, speed, films being used, ink, paper, etc. The combination of proper variables is very important to successful lamination. We also suggest that you run a sample test using actual components prior to setting up and running any large production run or when running a valuable, unique print. This is especially true with inkjet output. With a little practice, by asking the right questions, and by referring often to your owner-operator's manual and this video, you can become a finishing expert. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. We hope it was entertaining as well as informative. Please remember, if you ever have problems you cannot resolve with this or any other LEDCO equipment, please call us at 800-937-9293 or visit us online at www.ledcoinc.com. Thank you.